Hello, welcome, or welcome back as the case may be. This is Kelly Borsheim. I am a sculptor, and I'm working on a slightly larger than life-size portrait bust of a man from Texas. And um, I thought in this video I'd let you see how I work the small details, that I work from large to small, and I tend to develop the composition as a whole. Um, but as I'm doing that, I'm also putting the final idea, the final goal in there. So... I've got the main features in, and it seems that my client is relatively happy with the likeness. At least that's the message I'm getting. And so I want to make sure that as I develop the finishing um, touches, I'm looking again at all the fine details of the person's face because there's always a slight change to make something more like a somebody or not. And um, also, I had asked the client about his preferred... Uh, texture on the skin. I like to do texture with uh, the skin texture to have a little bit of, I have a rake tool that I use and I'll, um, I've shown that in other videos, but I, I want the skin to have a subtle texture, not cellulite, but some kind of thing that um, solves a problem because right now the clay is, the sculpture is in clay, plastilina to be exact. It's a wax-based plastilina that I'm using here called Tan AB225. And um, so the thing is, clay absorbs light, and bronze reflects light. So a lot of times I've seen people make a sculpture that probably looked good in clay, and then as soon as you put it into bronze, every single angle, every change of plane, everything becomes more exaggerated because light is reflected off of there. So what you see me doing now is I'm working on rounding the nose shaping the nose according to the photos that I'm working from and then I'm also trying to start making the flat skin because the client preferred the uh, skin to be smooth with no texture on it so I have to go with what he says and um, you'll see that I'm, I'm working on this it's it I would think that takes the longest time to do to get every single form fully rounded and not too exaggerated. You can see right now at the eyebrow right above my hand there that there's a very sharp uh, change. Whoops, I just changed it. But you can see there's a sharp change of plane from a, a more vertical plane and going into the eye socket and that edge there is way sharper than I want. So that's part of the refining process that I'm doing and um, that takes a lot of time to do. So Anyway, you can see a little bit of how I'm walking. Now, what I, I made a mistake at the beginning of, when I set up this video because I was thinking I really wanted you to see the details of things, and that's good. I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do on that to show you really up close because a lot of times with videos, I think you're so far back that if you really want to see each individual thing. Now here you can see I'm interrupting myself, but here you can see I'm using this wooden tool and it's sort of scumbling the texture. And that is because temperature is everything. If I get it too hot, it gets sticky and it pulls away. If I have it too cold, then it will scumble like this. And right now it's the 1st of January and I was working on this on New Year's Eve. And um, it's not moving so much because my my kitchen where I'm working is a little bit too cold for this clay so I need to get the room temperature a little warmer to really get the perfect movement of the clay and that's true whether you're working in wax and a lot of things are temperature dependent it's the nature of the beast it can work with you or it can work against you depending on these little factors so those are subtle things I want you to notice when you're doing your own kind of sculpting but the mistake that I made, and maybe it's not really a, a whole thing grave, but you can't necessarily tell from this because I'm not in the picture, but I'm actually working on the profiles. And I'm also doing a few things close to me and that sort of thing, but you can see you just saw my head poke through. I'm working to the side and I'm looking at the edges, and then to my left, behind the figure, there is the board that I have that has all the portrait pictures that I have to work from of this man in different angles. And so I'm trying to look at all those different pictures at several different ages and several different weights, because um, the commission I have to do is to make him um, at, at the larger size that he was in his life, and about the, at the age of 30. And most of the pictures are a little bit different from that. So I'm 
having to work around with this. And I also have pictures of different angles with um, the head. Right now he wants me to do a more classic Greek style sculpture. So I'm doing the head straight. He wants um, blank eye eyeballs. Um, and so there are, are little details like that that I'm trying to take these casual snapshot photos that I have and make them into a classical Greek, Greek sculpture. I guess that's summing up my, what my task is in a small uh, phrase. So as I'm shaping all of these little details, I'm looking at texture, I'm looking at the form, and I'm also standing back and looking at different angles and different perspectives. You'll see at some point in this video I'm going to stand up on a, um, a little footstool kind of thing, and I'm going to be looking from the bird's eye view, but also from below, and I'll check and see about the symmetry of the brows and the symmetry of the eyes, because I can tell you that the eyeball on the right is not really a sphere yet. And at some point, when I spun this piece around, I ended up looking at the depth between the bridge of the nose and how deep the eye socket, the eye goes at the most outermost point of the sphere of the eye. So anyway, the thing I wanted to point out to you is that it's very easy as you're working, you know, it's it's kind of like editing. I used to work for Hoovers.com back in the, I don't remember, maybe 90s, maybe 97, something like that. Anyway, Hoovers.com, it was a company, and maybe still is, that does business information, and I was a fact checker and um, edit, editor, copy editor, and stuff like that. So one of the things you find out you do is you can't do everything at once. You have to make one pass to read for the sense of things. You make another pass to start looking at various facts. But towards the end, you start making a pass to look at punctuation, indentation, the format of the page, how things are going like that. And make sure that you have consistency. If you try to do all of that at once, you're sure to miss things because you can't look for everything at once. Your brain is best focusing and specializing and making multiple passes. And it's the same way that I work with sculpture, actually. So... What I mean is that while I'm looking at the form and developing the thickness of the nose, the thickness of the bridge, the angle of the bridge, how far does it go back into his skull, because he has quite prominent brows, and um, I don't see that, I, I can see it in the full-on picture, but obviously not as much as I would if I had a full profile and things. So I'm again, I'm working from what I have and trying to read a photograph and the subtle changes of light that happen that tell me there's a plane change or a shape change. But as I'm doing this, you can see how easy it is. Look at how I'm sticking my pinky in there because that's the best tool that I have to do around any job. And then it turned out I used this stick here because my pinky turned out it was too big. Can you imagine <laughs> my pinky too big to stick in a guy's eye? Kind of gross, huh? Anyway, um, as I'm working this, it's very easy to sh change the shape of the eye in fact. So once I do the smoothing stuff, I still need to go back and look into the shape of the eye and make sure that I've got a lid there, make sure that, um, uh, you know, I don't really see eyelashes on him, but it's probably, it'll show up in the photograph as a dark thing, but I'm going to have to take a look at some other Greek sculptures to see maybe they didn't even deal with the addressing the eyelashes except for a woman. Um, I don't really seem to miss it on his face here, to be honest, so it could just be that if I build the shadows in properly, because sculpting is sc uh, creating light in three dimensions. So, you know, uh, we've talked about this before, I think, that if you look at sculptures, especially large sculptures that go far away from the viewer, such as on the top of a building or something, you know, um, Texas has a great museum about... Um, the Bob Bullock Museum, I think it is. And they have a copy, I think it's plaster, of the statue on top of the capital of Texas in Austin. When you see that at level, because they, I think you can walk on the second or third floor or something and see the top of the face, it is so exaggerated and crude. And a lot of that is the same idea, actually, as when I was a majorette in high school, and they kept making me put on makeup and makeup and makeup. That was in the 80s, and you had to wear bright, bright blue eyeshadow and bright this. But we had to exaggerate the makeup because we were all in a f football field trying to impress people that were a good distance away from us. So if you wanted your sh eyes to show up, you had to put on all, all this stuff. It's the same way with the sculpture. The further away the audience is, 
the more exaggerated the features have to read so that you can see light bouncing off the forehead and dark going into the eye sockets and all that kind of thing. So those are very real concerns and it, it's all everything is connected in my brain which is why I'm telling you all these examples that seem unrelated but they're all it's all a matter of uh, perception and reading. In fact, even in the Shakespeare theater, that's part of the reason they developed the mask with the comedy and the, the tragedy. And everything was so exaggerated because you need to tell emotion in a very short time of space, but carry it quite well to get the effect and the emotion you're trying to give the uh, viewer so that he can enjoy the story and follow the story, in fact. So these are the manipulations that artists do, which is also another argument about why... Even though we have the technology for you personally, you could go stand in a pose, have the computer scan you, and then zip, 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 cut out a sculpture, just a view. That's not a work of art. That's a copy of a human being. And um, it's, it's like, I can't remember which artist said it now, but it's a famous quote that says, I'm not making a blah, 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 whatever the object was. I'm making a painting. Uh, you probably know the quote, and I, I remember it in other times. But so... These, this video, I don't know if this is going to be a dull thing for somebody else to watch. I never think of uh, sculpture as being a spectator sport per se, except for, I think it was Bruno Lucchese who went to the Loveland Sculpture Shows back in the early 2000s possibly, or, or, 1900, or 1990s when I was there. He completely stunned me. He did a portrait bust using blocks of clay and throwing them on there to the music of Beethoven's. I think it was a Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, but uh, my point is that that was the most theatrical production I've ever seen, and the portrait was glorious, uh, really captured his personality, and yet it was a very modern type thing because, again, he was using blocks of clay that he would just cut off and throw on so kind of thing. It was fantastic. I, I've not been able to forget that. Um, I know it was a Lucchese. I just can't remember if it was Bruno or if it was the other one because it's a family of um, Italian-American artists. Um, so anyway, um, I'm blabbing on all kinds about uh, things, but uh, suffice it to say... Sometimes I'm looking straight on the figure like I am in this moment, and other times, this is why I like to have a table with a um, with a movable top because it's easier for me to move the sculpture to get my point of view changed than for me to move my own position um, when I'm working close like this. Obviously, you know both of them work. Uh, I can move my own point of view if it's a slight one exaggerated or the other. So. I'm getting the prominent brows, you see. And sometimes at the beginning, I am doing sort of the Bruno Lucchese method of just putting on a piece of clay to say, okay, it comes out here, and then making sure that I don't make that out follow all the way around. For example, I'm working on the eye sockets now, the muscles over the eye. They're obviously two distinct. Do you see the shadow that I have below the brow? Very Two very distinct forms. And um, they need to stay that way, otherwise they won't read well. But also remember that the eye socket, the reason you see so much eye in the profile is because the eye socket on the outer part of the head is going to the back, okay? So it's more open on that side. And towards the nose, you don't really see the eye as much. If you were able to cut off the nose, you would probably see it. But otherwise, you have these other forms that sort of take over and, and don't cause the depth and the openness that the other one is. But now as I watch this video and sort of narrate it for you, I can see I'm going to be working on the hair today <laughs> and also a little bit on that ear on on this side that's showing now because um, I haven't developed that as much and I ended up raising the ears a little bit. So again, this is the thing that the client needs to be happy and from what I can tell, he's quite happy with the likeness I've gotten so far, but I need to be happy and I need to be able to do all these little details that are best. I don't have a lot of images of the ears, and certainly not in different positions, but I do have a good full-on front face view, which tells me how far the ears stick out and that the top stick out more, and that you know you have this and that, little innies and outies of which of the parts and stuff. But um, right now you can see I'm working on the symmetry of the nose and going into the eye socket. And I tend to shoot for symmetry, knowing that none of us have it. 
because symmetry is something that I find extremely difficult for my brain to to do. And um, right now I'm lifting up the eye there because I don't. He does have eyes that seem to slope down because he's got so thick of um, the muscles up in, or muscle or maybe it's fat tissue. I don't know up above the eyeball. However, he doesn't look sad. Um, in my family, and maybe like Paul McCartney family, you have those sort of sad or bedroom eyes, as we call them. But if you look at his eyes in the pictures, the inside corner is actually lower than the outside corner. Mine are too. But most people, when they draw me, when I was in art school and stuff, and people would draw me, they always draw me looking sad. And it's because they're look, they're seeing the, the muscles muscle and maybe fat structure around my eye, but they're not actually looking at the relationship between the inner quarter and the outer quarter. So I'm trying to keep all of those things in balance and thinking about all of the different things that are happening in the landscape, alternating landscape, the weaving landscape of the muscles in the face. They're just like the muscles in the body, you know, insertion points and uh, where's the belly of the muscle, where, where does the fat go when fat exists and that kind of thing. So these are all fascinating to me and um, necessary if you're going to make a portrait you've got to at least you don't have to necessarily name all the muscles or something I've probably forgotten more about muscles than I know and I haven't taught anatomy in a long time at this point although I hope to again I think that would be fun but um, you need to be aware of the fact that the face has a lot of bone structure on it, and you can feel that with your own hand. Touch your cheekbone, touch your chin. Uh, you know, you can feel the teeth underneath your upper lip. All of those things influence the outer form. I, I think the forensic sculptures that they make uh, where they build a face off of a skull that somebody found, you know, dug up or something somewhere, and they want to know who it is. I think that stuff is fascinating, and that would be a person that really knows all the likelihood of the muscles. You know, there's a certain limit where you're not going to be able to go so far because, you know, noses, the end of them is cartilage. So you can have very different things. And, of course, age will make nose bigger and bulbous, that sort of thing. So it's it's a never-ending study to be creating something. And portrait may not be something that you go, oh, wow, that's so exciting and wonderful. But to do a portrait well and convey an individual personality using only shape, line, form, and sometimes color, that's a real challenge. And I think it's amazing. I mean, I think caricature people are amazing because how many times have you seen something that's an obvious distortion of a face, and yet it kind of looks like the person that they're drawing? And, you know, that to me is an amazing sort of study. That's just really cut into the essence of what makes a person looks different from another. Because as you, you know, when you're teaching anatomy, you generally teach ideal proportions. You know, you have the length of one eye in between each eye. So if you put the middle eye there, you'd have one, two, three eyes, okay? My eyes tend to be closer than that. And I have another artist friend whose eyes are further apart than that. But those are the things that you want to pay attention to so that you make it look like the person. If you put my eyes further apart than that one eye in the middle, or even if you put it one eye in the middle, like the ideal says, ideal is really probably average, um, because I think ideal just has a word in it that sounds judgmental, doesn't it? Okay. Um, you wouldn't necessarily have it look like me. Somebody else might not necessarily know why it doesn't really look like me, but when we look at people, we look at eyes, we look at mouths, we look at hands when we're communicating. There are a lot of other things that we notice, and of course, if you put a hook nose on a person that has a uh, ski slope nose, then yes, you will notice those differences. But um, I always find it confusing because I tend to think people look rather different in profile than they do face on, and we're used to looking at people face on. So sometimes, sometimes I look at profiles and I think, wow, I wouldn't have thought that was the same person. Okay, don't measure like I do to see how I did that. At, at an angle on one side, and then I did. That's a that's a problem with me having a camera in front because if I were in front of this figure making my measurements, I wouldn't be doing all this. I'm trying to stay out of the camera to let you see what I'm uh, out of the point of view so that you see what I'm doing. Um, you've got to make sure that you're measuring apples and apples. So when I had that stick at a slight diagonal, 
that's like measuring you know a triangle with you can't measure the length of the triangle and think that putting it at a diagonal is going to measure the same length it won't so anyway and you can see here again I'm changing the point of views around but you see I'm really trying to make this get a symmetrical feel if I could get symmetrical then I could easily say all right, he's not symmetrical, so let me add a little more to this side or that side. But um, I usually don't need to do that because when I study the face or any part of the body, actually, and I say, all right, which way is it going to not be symmetrical? Or in the case of a fantasy piece, I say, okay, I want this idea to be masculine. What are qualities of masculine that are different from feminine? For example, you usually have wide shoulders or narrow hips, that kind of thing. So if I'm making something that's masculine... I'd rather err on the side of making shoulders more broad than less broad. Does that make sense? So in this case, if I see, you know, at the, at the weight that I'm supposed to make this, because a face obviously gains weight with the body, uh, we all sort of match it, it ourselves, um, that puts um, a lot more substance into the face, but the eyes, of course, are going to be relatively fixed inside that sculpture, that um, skull. So it gives the impression that his eyes are closer together. His younger pictures, it looked like he had the ideal distance, that one eye between between two, you know, each one. Each eye length is the same, and then one eye length in between, you know, between the nose, or not between the nose, over the nose. Anyway, um, so this is the process. And you can see that sharp line that I drew over the eye. That's sort of a reminder to myself, don't fill in that whole shape. That has to have two separate forms, the eyebrow and then the, the baggy uh, sort of part over the actual eye. Leave your comments and your questions below, please. I appreciate your letting me know if you like this sort of comment, uh, content. Um, if you're learning something, if this is helping to you, if you're interested, even if you're an art collector and you find just the process fascinating as I do, um, I would appreciate having some feedback, and if there's something you'd like me to cover in a future video, please let me know that too. Um, so even just your liking or subscribing to my channel is helpful to me because it gives me an idea of what sort of things that you would like to know about and to see about. So I appreciate that a lot, and um, uh, I thank you for watching too. And also, if you would like to see some of my finished sculptures, please go to my website at borsheimarts.com. I have a lot of sculptures that, especially for the bronze, that I've got molds for and I've made the pieces, but I've sold them. And I need to put them on my site so that people can order from them. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. But also, it would show, you know, what other things I can do kind of thing. So... Anyway, there's Borsheim Arts, but also I have shops. I have a shop on Etsy that I sell more of art prints and art products, but I do have a few chosen original pieces there. And um, so subscribe to my newsletter, subscribe to this YouTube, YouTube channel to get and hit the notification bell, and they'll let you know when I post something new. Also, if you want to see some of the background stuff that a lot of people don't see, go to patreon.com slash Kelly Borsheim, and you can become an art Patreon uh, art, art patron at any level, and that'll get you some of that content as well. Thank you so much for watching, and I love your feedback and appreciate your joy of sculpture. Ciao, ciao for now.